I'd like to welcome you to this. This is our inaugural Trust Elevate uh, Symposium, and I've organised it in the capacity as chair of the UKIS Age Verification Group. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, Minister uh, Baroness Shields is joining us today. Um, I know how important online safety, child online safety is to Joanna, and she has been working tirelessly on the We Protect initiative, and I'm sure she'll say a few words about that in a minute. Um, as you all know, the Conservative pre-election manifesto pledge was to limit children's access to adult content. And we will be talking about this today. And there are significant initiatives in terms of how do we develop a self-regulatory approach to solving this issue? And can we ad the ad address the issue by having a verify once, use many times solution? Um, and a government consultation on age verification will be launched later this autumn as a precursor to legislation. I'm also really delighted to uh, welcome Pat Manson from DG Connect, uh, who is one of the driving forces behind the Better Internet for Kids initiative at a European level, and for whom I have the utmost respect because of her commitment to this. Um, and what's important at an EU level, thank you Pat, what, what's important at an EU level is the EIDAS legislation, which creates a predictable kind of regulatory environment. So as many of you will know, uh, the UK is a little bit behind other European countries in terms of developing bank ID, mobile ID and EID. Um, and the legislation, this predictable regulatory environment creates the opportunity for legislation to mandate companies to age check. Um, and what that means is that uh, for example, the Tobacco Products Directive uh, includes a, a clause that requires age verification when you're distance selling their, those products. And as many of you will also know, there's a consultation taking place about the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which may uh, require age verification. Um, and the data protection uh, regulation, the new version, may also do. So there is a lot going on in, from a legislative perspective that may be driving the whole notion towards uh, age verification, not just of adults, but also of minors, and that's a critical thing. Um, I'd also like to welcome Lord Errol, whom I've had the pleasure of working with uh, since November. And Merlin recognises, he's uh, prescient in terms of recognising the importance of, that, of those legislative drivers in terms of uh, UK businesses maybe being behind the curve because they don't necessarily at this point in time have the ability to age check. Um, so he, along with Chris Ratcliffe, who is here in the audience, they co-chair the uh, Digital Policy Alliance Age Verification Group, and that brought a number of industry sectors together. That's gambling, uh, e-cigarettes, uh, adult content providers, and alcohol. And they've developed, um, they're funding the development of the BSI 1 to 96 age verification or age checking code of practice. And Merlin will speak in, in a few moments about that BSI standard. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you that I'm the technical author of that standard. So that work has kicked off. Um, so online child safety is an incredibly important issue. And one, it's the longest standing issue in terms of internet safety. How do you know that this is a child who's online? Um, and one of the big challenges, weirdly, is that many industry and safety experts have kind of an entrenched view and think that uh, if you're going to uh, age verify people, um, that, we've, that there's going to be massive concerns about privacy and uh, liability. Um, okay, so there's concerns about privacy and liability. So I've organized this at the top. That is the old set of concerns. And underneath, these legal concerns are addressed by trust frameworks. And today, you will hear a lot about trust frameworks. Um, and some of the, most, of the world's most influential privacy ex experts are here. Edgar uh, Whitley is here, Pat Walsh and others, who will allay any, anybody's fears about uh, privacy because you can do anonymous uh, age checking online. The other concern that industry comes up with, oh, this is going to be overly burdensome compliance costs. Oh, you don't want to be doing that. But actually, as many of the companies that are sitting in the audience today realize that actually if you do a federated approach to age uh, checking, there is a potential to monetize the data sets that they have in relation to their customers. So it could actually be a way to generate revenue. In addition, you can drive down the costs if you use a federated model to go from, it's currently 25p to 175 to age tech for a gambling site, depending on the transaction volumes. You can bring that down to tiny amounts of money. So there are commercial opportunities, and that's what we'll be looking at today. Um, and th there is the potential to generate revenue and also uh, promote good digital citizenship. 
The other concern that industry have, and, and sometimes um, so internet safety people say is, oh, we, there's an absence of standards. Um, and that was certainly the case back in 2008. But if you fast forward to today in 2015, there are global standards in relation to interoperability, um, which means that from a, a company's perspective, integrating online age checking capability is a simple, a much simpler process and can be done in a matter of hours rather than a big onerous job that will uh, put your product production line off kilter. Um, the next concern that is often raised is, oh, well, this will just be a barrier to innovation because startup companies won't be able to pay for this and it'll all be terrible. But actually, it's a business enabler. And as we're in the age of privacy-enhancing technologies, there's a paradigm shift that's kind of occurring. Um, and that is actually one of the big themes of today. Who owns the data belonging to a child? Who owns that data? And have we now reached a tipping point where there's a paradigm shift? And with these privacy-enhancing technologies, we want to enable not only children and young people, but adults of all ages to have the means by which they can assert the age so companies know OK, I'm under 12, I want this kind of content to be served to me. Um, and have that happen in a way where the personally identifying information about the child is stripped, and also the date of birth is not exchanged, it's just the age band. So some of the privacy experts will talk about that. And I'm delighted that some of the experts in this kind of field, Chris Pilling, William Heath, and Robin Wilton, some of the thought leaders with respect to data ownership um, and open standards, are on the panels today. Um, so the purpose of today was to bring together experts in the identity and payment space who will talk about how innovation policy, in terms of policy and technology is enabling the scope for online age checking mechanisms. And also, crucially, can you include age checking in payment protocols? And Louise Bennett is here to talk about the standards around that. So the speaker lineup is just an absolutely stellar cast of, of people, and everybody brings a wealth of expertise. However, today we're not just engaging in an intellectual process. Um, in one of the panels today, we're going to explore the scope to test delivering uh, online age checking for minors. And this, the technical architecture that's going to be described to you today uh, is, applies also to the age checking of um, adults. So I'd like to stress that today is about audience engagement. The whole purpose of bringing everybody here today is to create a shared understanding. And the identity space, which is like other specialty sectors, has its own kind of jargon in terms of you know, credentialing, onboarding, authorization, authentication. So there are people in the audience who are not familiar with those. And I've, I've, I've asked the speakers to make sure that if you're using those terms, explain what they mean. And essentially what this means is if you don't understand something, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Just put your hand up because that, that question is going to be something that somebody else wanted to ask as well. And we want to make it um, as engaging as possible. Um, so the Twitter handle for today is uh, uh, hashtag agecheck. Um, and I'd also like, we've got support from Paddy Cosgrove at Web Summit. Uh, the Web Summit is held in Dublin. It's a big event. He's given us two tickets. They're worth £960 each. Uh, so we've put whoever's attended, you get to, uh, into a raffle, and we'll raffle those at the end of the day. Um, I want to give a special a mention to our sponsors um, and say, and thank you especially for having faith in a two-person startup for putting this uh, kind of gig together. So Avoco Identity, Yachty, Very Me, and Mind Candy, and also Equifax and uh, Timpsons. And before I introduce, so the housekeeping, there's bathrooms just out uh, in the coffee area. And the Wi-Fi is BL Guest Conference, and the password is BL Guest 5T23. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Baroness Shields. Thank you, Rachel, or Dr. O'Connor, I should say. Should say. I met Rachel um, almost a decade ago, and I just before we begin, I, I wanted to say that at that moment when I met her, I knew that she'd make a huge contribution to the industry and to online safety, and not just here in the UK, but we work together at Bebo, and some of the work that was started there has really laid the foundation for the future, and I'm really grateful to you, so thank you very much. 
Um, I'm also, I think it's important to, uh, everything's about serendipity in a moment in time. In this particular moment in time, I think it's important to bring these highly informed voices that Rachel mentioned to the stage. These are industry's most valued experts on this important topic. Now, harmful content online is not a problem that we can ever solve completely. So we should say that first and foremost. But the UK's made real progress. And Prime Minister Cameron has signaled that the UK has an intent to lead this agenda on a global basis. And he's made a ministry, and I put me in responsible for online safety, and it's my great privilege to do that job. The UK Council for Child Internet Safety is a focal point for government, industry, and civil society to come together to address online challenges. Since its inception back in 2001, the model has demonstrated its effectiveness and it's held in high regard all around the world as the best practice. The Internet Watch Foundation, which was started in 1996 by the online industry as a self-regulatory body, has made an astounding impact as well. Today, nearly half of UK hosted child sexual abuse content is removed within an hour of a takedown notice being issued. The IWF is now providing hashes of child sexual abuse images to the online industry to speed up identification and removal of content worldwide. It is now much easier for consumers, too, to filter out harmful content. The UK's leading broadband providers give customers an unavoidable choice of whether or not to install network level, fil level filters. And 95% of customers in the UK have either made a choice to have filters applied or they've been installed by default. Default on filters are applied to a vast majority of the mobile phones in the UK and the main public Wi-Fi providers filter 18 rated content by default as well. As Rachel mentioned, technology solutions and industry cooperation is what supports all of this progress and we are grateful to all of you for your contributions. And all this was achieved by an industry acting voluntarily. Moreover, we are the first country to reach an agreement with key online platforms such as YouTube and Vivo and the music industry to include age, to include age ratings for music videos, which we hope will become a norm in countries all around the world. But where we've, we think we've made the biggest step forward is the creation of the We Protect Global Alliance. Last December's We Protect Summit united 50 countries, various international organizations, 20 leading technology companies, and 10 civil society organizations in a commitment to tackle child sexual abuse and exploitation online. We agreed that the UK will work with UNICEF to establish a new global fund to end violence against children that will put in place the necessary resources to better identify victims, track down criminals, and remove child sexual abuse material from the internet and we will forge strong industry partnerships to develop the technology of solutions. We will meet again in Abu Dhabi on November 16th and 17th, and we invite you all to attend. This is where we will make sure that countries have the capacity to ensure that standards for investigation, victim support, and other support services are in place. But the internet, as you know, has no borders, and we cannot do this vital work alone. International cooperation is key, and there's still a great, a great deal more to do. To that end, in my role, I have three overarching priorities. First, making the internet a safer place for children by tackling online abuse, exploitation, and why we're here today, access to harmful content. Secondly, to help counter radical extremism online and stop, and stop that horrible effect on the young people here in the UK. And thirdly, promote di informed digital citizenship. With respect to age verification for pornographic content, let me be clear that the government has no wish to restrict adults from free access to legal content. But there is no moral or intellectual case for children be ex being exposed to pornography or to have free access to it. The teenage brain has become a subject of much research recently. University of Pennsylvania neurologist Dr. Francis Jensen says that teenage brains are hungry for stimulation, yet the development of their frontal lobes is not yet complete. The repeated viewing of pornography can result in neural adaptation, which means literally the rewiring of the brain. The recent meta-analysis by Gert Martin Hald et al. strongly suggests that supports the correlation with regard to porn pornography, including violence against women. 
The teenage brain adapts to pornography and changes occur in its internal circuitry, particularly in the pleasure and reward pathways. In time, the brain seeks more extreme pornography to get the same effect, with terrifying implications, potentially including the normalization of sexual violence among teens. This is a real concern. None of the most popular pornographic sites visited by UK users today require age controls. This is totally unacceptable and needs to be tackled, and we will hold the adult industry account for any practices that cause children distress and harm. Just as DVDs containing explicit pornographic content are subject to age controls in licensed sex shops, we should expect the same thing for online explicit content. We just want to bring the online world in, in line with the offline world, and we're now exploring options. We will begin a consultation on how to affect age verification for all websites containing pornographic material in the coming months. And I hope that everyone here in this room today will feed into that process. Feedback and advice from ATFOD, BBFC, the Digital Policy Alliance, Trust Elevate, and representatives of the adult industry, as well as charities and academics, has already been sought, and it will continue throughout the process. This government recognizes the need for robust education materials in schools as well. As of last September, eSafety has been a compulsory part of the national computing curriculum. Educational information for parents and consumers is available on, on Internet Matters, which is a joint project launched two years ago by leading ISPs. Parent Info, a collaboration between the National Crime Agency's Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center Command and Parent Zone, a leading UK online safety organization, as well as from a range of NGOs and other organizations. We are working with the Department of Education to explore further ways to educate children and their parents in how to be safe online. The government will also take all necessary steps to ensure that European regulations around net neutrality and the filtering of content do not negatively affect our child protection measures. The government is alive to the fact that age verif verification is not without challenges. Delivering age verification to protect children as consumers in a range of areas will require effort and action from a wide range of organizations. From high street stores and their online presence, law enforcement, credit card companies, supermarkets, adult content providers, trading standards, parents, schools, you name it. Given all of these stakeholders, any meaningful progress will require that we all work together, which is why this symposium today is so important. I want to recognize and support the work that Trust Elevate, BSI, and the Digital Policy Alliance are, are conducting in exploring the potential for a federa federated approach to age verification. This involves a verify once, use many times system that would encompass gambling, e-commerce, as well as pornography. And I'm encouraged to hear their announcement today. I hope this will build on work across government in this area, and I hope we, they will work in partnership with the Government Digital Service. All of these issues and many more will need to be addressed as we consider the right approach to age verification. But let me conclude by saying I'm incredibly optimistic. There's steely resolve here in this room in, in the industry and across the political spectrum to protect children from harmful content. As a result, millions of children will be healthier and happier. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to invite Pat to... to I'm just getting some instructions on how to use the technology. As you see, I come from DG Connect, which is communications, <laughs> networks and technology and content. Right. And I'm head of the unit that's responsible for inclusion skills in youth. And the youth component is that, is the Better Internet for Kids. First of all, I'd like to thank Rachel and Trust Elevate very much for inviting, us to take part, inviting me to take part in the meeting today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing all the discussions and what is going to be, a very, I think, is a very complex debate, giving rise to a wide range of issues. Rachel asked me to do some scene setting from the Commission's point of view, from the BIC perspective. Um, 
in order to highlight why the debate that you're t taking part in today is so important. And I'm going to start, some of you may be very well aware that three years ago, does that work? Voila. This is so you can look at something and not necessarily the speaker. Um, <laughs> Three years ago, the Commission issued its strategy to make, the, make a better internet for children or a better internet for kids, which we have called BIC, B-I-K. And the driver for this was to recognise the role of the internet as a place of new opportunity for children, which they should be encouraged to exploit. We saw it very much as an enabler, an enabler for engagement, for acquisition of skills, for enjoyment and for creativity. And um, in this, we wanted to support the shift from the view that children were only passive consumers in this environment to becoming active creators online. So we also highlighted the market opportunities for positive and age-appropriate content and services. This is not to say that the strategy didn't recognise the need to protect and that it was an environment without risks, the risks of access to harmful content, harmful contact and harmful conduct. And these three C's, I think, still lie at the core of a lot of the actions we're undertaking. But we need to balance the opportunity and risk. And one of the things I've come to realise is that this is not a straightforward equation and it's influenced by quite a wide range of factors. One of the one influences um, is public policy. We have recently done a study mapping the policies of all the member states in the field of online child safety. And there's been an exercise to correlate that with the research fund findings of EU Kids Online. And this has discovered that those members, well, it has identified a number of clusters, but it is clear that those member states where public policy and public intervention are greatest, we have the most effective policies. At one end will be the policies that are deemed to be more restrictive or protective, and there we see more regulatory intervention. And the other context is where the policies um, um, support much more experimentation online and the UK actually falls into that category and is in the cluster where the greatest public intervention and evaluation and feedback on policies is carried out. And this is not um, a given for most of the member states. It's also a reflection, I think, on the level of maturity of the, of the member states in entering into this area. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so creating safe and creative environments for children online is complex and it requires multiple solutions. The, when I went back to reread the communication, because I don't keep it entirely in my head all the time, I discovered that the issues and challenges it set out remain perfectly valid today, but we have to see them in a changing context where there are new trends and the new technologies make us have to reassess the challenges or the goals in a different way. There, we know already, obviously, that children are going online younger and younger. There are, the Internet of Things is present, and the way children will interact with the Internet and environment is going to require different solutions. Recent research has shown that there is much, much greater use of smartphones and mobile, and that associated with that, those, child those uh, children who use mobile technologies to go online are more likely to use them in a communicative way, in a participatory fashion, that they will do so unsupervised, which is logical, but that parents in this context are also less likely to exercise controls or use technical solutions, they're more likely to intervene as mediators. So there is, a, there is quite a rich diversity of approaches and cultural views of how to keep children safe online. But the bottom line still is, of course, that children have to be uh, children have to be safe and that content and services have to be trusted. My second element in this is that we have long recognised that this is a shared responsibility. And it's a shared responsibility because the services and issues we are talking about are cross-border within the EU, 
but they also have a strong interna international dimension. And that's particularly the case with the child abuse material and the work we do with hotlines, but also because the industry providers are not only active in Europe, they are active globally. We're dealing with global players. So we need the input and the commitment of all stakeholders. The member states have a role to play in supporting the policy aims, and our role with this is to encourage exchange of practices and promote um, different models. We don't say there's one size fits all, but there are different models ensuring that the member states join up the different policy initiatives that contribute to the big environment, which may be education policies, law enforcement policies, um, um, Inclusion policies, it varies from member state to member state, which ministry actually holds the pen or which ministries hold the pen. And it's not a single, it is very, very far from being common across uh, in, in the member states. And the model in Europe, in, in Europe, in the UK, of a coordinating body is actually one of the long-standing examples of how there's been a real effort to join up policy initiatives. The... There is a strong role for us also in the regulatory area. We have the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the E-Commerce Directive, which dictates the notice and takedown provisions, the Directive on Combating sexual, uh, Child Sexual Exploitation, just to name the three core ones in our area. We, as well as the regulatory intervention, we see our primary role also as facilitating the cooperation with industry. And we have placed a strong emphasis on the importance of self-regulation in this domain. It is fast changing. It requires much more rapid responses. Sometimes regulation can provide a, a wider approach, but the issues that you need to direct to children have to be more specific and more granular uh, and go beyond the, scope of the immediate scope of regulation. And in the past years, we have worked with industry to develop uh, the rating system for video games came out of a self-regulatory approach brokered by the Commission. The work we've done most recently has seen um, progress made or discussions on rating apps and encouraging um, interoperability between different rating schemes, and that's a project we are currently funding at European level. We've also funded the pilot project on how we can rate UGC, because this is emerging as one of the main issues online as to how children can be uh, prevent, how you can stop um, inappropriate or harmful content being viewed by children. So we have a pilot project direct, uh, led by the BBFC, in fact, working on this. Uh, and this is something that we are looking at how we can build on and progress it in the future. And we have funding. We have a long history of funding programmes specifically for Safer Internet, but is now part of the Connecting Europe facility where we fund a core platform which will provide central services and resources and also a technology infrastructure which might link to other infrastructures such as EID. And we support, through co-funding, the services that are run in each member state. There is, of course, um, and it was mentioned by Rachel, a wider context to the policies we have in children. Children are a special group of consumers, and they allow us or can help us to create um, uh, a magnified view on issues which then have an impact in other areas. So I don't like to use the, me the metaphor of thin end of the wedge, but it's something creates a focus or a prism that actually highlights issues that have um, a wider impact. Trust and security is at the core. And if you read the documents from the Commission that have been coming out in recent months, you'll realise that this is trust and security are words that are increasingly coming to the forefront in many of the conversations that are taking place, not least in the context of the proposals for the digital single market, where they are identified as key levers for the development of advanced digital services, digital networks, and for innovative services, and also as a key element of the delivery of public services to the citizens where we're looking towards a really inclusive use of the digital service by the public and by all citizens. And this brings us back to EID. As Rachel has mentioned, the Commission has worked on identity. Identity is, is, is at the core. And we have 
established both the regulatory framework uh, through the IDAS directive, but we're also working, uh, again in the context of the Connecting Europe facility, on developing technical solutions with the member states to test out the technologies in order to deliver uh, viable, cross secure cross-border transactions. So, in a sense, we've come full circle. Uh, I'm looking at this from the child issues. I'm going to be very interested to hear particularly what your technical debate is today, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot that I can take back home and hopefully inform my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. That was wonderful. Um, so now I'm going to welcome to the stage Lord Errol. All yours. Right. Okay, next. Oh, go on. Go that one. Hello. Um, so this is my usual declaration of interest, which one has to do these days. Um, and I've been around the sort of IT world and stuff for a long time. And some time ago, I got interested in this whole question of how we're we going to actually operate online in realistically. Um, and try and mirror some of the real world where things are slightly fudged, but at the same time probably give greater protection you get in the real world, and that's the problem. So the question about age checking on the online world is what's the purpose? It's to protect vulnerable, and it's not just children. That's the obvious one that everyone's talking about, and that's going to be the focus of today. But look at the number of people who get ripped off the whole time, trusting people. Because the interesting thing about honest people is they tend to trust, because people behave towards other people as they behave themselves. And so that is how we see, particularly pensioners and people being ripped off for large amounts of money. In fact, um, my um, secretary, just a few days ago, um, her mother protected someone because this older lady said, I've got to go to the bank to withdraw all this cash, because she'd been persuaded her bank account was raided and she had to get this cash out and give it to someone. I mean, absolutely dotty, but these things happen. So the trusting is another lot you've got to defend. And also, you've got to defend business. At the end of the day, business has moved online. It has to, therefore, comply with certain things and comply with social norms. So we've got to protect business. They've got to be able to operate. And it's the other bit that people always say, look at the one side, the children. But on the other side, if you bankrupt all the businesses, um, what's going to happen? Or you drive things underground, which is even more dangerous. Let's get on to that in a second. Um, I'm going to go through very rapidly because I'm actually already um, eating into your coffee time. Um, the, there are various things that are age sensitive and people forget all the different things that there are. I mean, the adult content's the obvious one, which is always people are talking about. It's the, it's the one that everybody knows about the pornography, it's what they're upset about, etc. The interesting thing about that is, which doesn't apply to all of them, is for a lot of the stuff that's online, there is no payment process. And I want to point that out to you because this comes to where do you put in the checks? if you're going to do some checks. And a lot of people have got opinions about it, but I'm afraid I don't think that a lot of those opinions necessarily work for all cases, and it's one thing that's got to be looked at. Violence, games, things like that. I can remember my mother, I'm sorry, my wife giving my son a copy of Grand Theft Auto, Wipe Out the World, or whatever it was called at the time, which was age 16 rated when he was 14. When I sort of said, was this proper? He said, Dad, get a life. So. You know, these things happen, and sometimes parents don't really realize it. Um, he actually made an interesting point, which I will digress on to very quickly, which is that I said, you know, this is ridiculous teaching you to do it. He said, no, no, Dad, I realize this isn't real. He said, far more dangerous is the Bruce Willis-type film, where you beat up someone with an iron bar, and they get up again and fight back. That doesn't happen in the real world, but it looks like real people. And it's an interesting point, and very perspicacious for a 14-year-old. Anyway, um, weapons, knives. Um, obviously controlled, um, nicotine, alcohol, financial service. People forget you can't give credit to someone um, under, they can't incur debt under a certain age. Crowdfunding sites, therefore, all should be looking at these sort of things. Some of them require know your client, but sometimes the know your client checks may not be very thorough. Uh, PayPal is an interesting example there. Social groupings, that's the obvious one that people talk about. You want to know the people you're dealing with, particularly on a dating site, are the sort of age group you think you're dealing with. And of course, then we've also got to protect children from the older people when they've got a 12-year-old or 8-year-old's chat site. You want to make sure the people coming into it really are in that age group, 
or accredited people. You know, you don't want these things work in all sorts of different directions. An educational material, particularly say a PHSC material, may be only relevant to certain age groups, and they're very interested in this whole thing to make sure that they're giving the right the right material to the right age cohorts, or sorry, the right age cohorts who access the right material. So there's lots of other applications of this. It isn't just an 18 plus or 21 plus thing at all. Um, so what's ha happened is started setting up a two-pronged approach uh, a little while back. Chris I ran into Chris Radcliffe, who was saying, you know, we've, if we're going to operate in um, an online world, we've got to do something about this, or we're going to be driven offshore. And the whole thing, all the British industry will just collapse, and if some foreign websites will run everything, and you won't be able to do anything about it. And I thought, this is the trouble. It'll be outside our UK control. So if we can come up with something that's sensible, because... Other countries feel the same. Other societies and cultures feel the same. Then it suddenly becomes acceptable universally. Then suddenly it'll work because everyone will be doing it voluntarily. And you do more by giving people incentives to do something than you will ever do by forcing them to do something. That's one thing I've learned in life. Rules are made to be got round. Social pressures, etc., incentives work. And interesting enough, one, for instance, if you take the adult content industry, getting rid of the underage from it would be very useful because they consume bandwidth, but they don't pay for anything. So it's just a cost to you. So actually, if you could filter out, I don't know what percentage it is of the accesses which come from uh, people who've got no ability to pay for the stuff and no desire to pay for the stuff, um, that could actually be quite beneficial in business terms and worth a little bit of money. So anyway, we've got two things. The first one, which is the highlight, which is ba um, the BSI, Public Available Specification. It's basically a, a code of practice, but code of practice can be quite strong because if you can show you've adhered to it, it shows you've done your best if it's a good one. And we called it, in the end, of a lot of debate, 1 to 96. I um, don't know why, lots of different things. But it isn't in a series that will matter if, we, if it gets expanded and reused. Um, this is not going to look at the whys and the wherefores, what's behind it. It's not going to specify single methods of doing it. It's not going to say where the checks have to be inserted in the system. I hear everything from ISPs through processors to the merchant themselves. And then people get discussing point of delivery for say, alcohol, etc. That's for other places. We're trying to look at what processes will be sufficient with a sufficient degree of confidence for your business thing to say, I've done my best by society and by the, and by the law. Anyway, that, in order to get there as well, because that now goes and develops its own thing, but it will be influenced, and the steering group will be influenced by great debate outside. And so will the minister, who's got the most difficult job here, of fulfilling a manifesto commitment from the Conservatives. How she's going to do it, I've got no idea. But <laughs> we're going to try and help with that by having, we've got this large group together now, or medium-sized group now together in the Digital Policy Alliance, discussing this with people from all sorts of sectors, from observer groups, from people with interested things, um, together discussing this, and they're discussing the different ways of doing it, the different ways it will work, won't work, the business cases, all the bits and pieces around it. And of course, you know, in this also comes the great elephant in the room. This stuff is legal, it's lawful, but not for certain groups. That's what it is. And people keep thinking, you know, can we put this stuff out, get rid of it? I don't like this sort of thing, you know. And maybe you don't. Maybe you're anti-drink. Maybe you are anti-smoking. Maybe you are anti any adult content at all, any pornography at all. You know, it doesn't matter. The point is it is legal for certain people. So, you know, we, we've just got to work in the real world. Um, and it's the affordability in business case. If you haven't got a good business case, it's not going to get off the ground. And driving it underground is the worst possible thing to do because then people just try to breach the rules. People will find ways of doing it. It doesn't take children to learn to quit long to learn about proxy servers, Tor, and other things like that. So, and don't think they don't find out quite quickly. So let's get something that works out there. And so this, the bottom group, the DPA, that work group, is key to a lot of the approach because that's where the big discussion is happening. And the bits that are useful will be filtered out of that into the, into the paths. And I hope that we will come up with something that the minister can then use when they produce regulations and rules around this to try and enforce it by whatever means they do. Um, and I think I've covered everything I want to say, which got you to a coffee only slightly late. Um, just wanted to check. Are there any other useful thing for you all, which, um, which might be very useful, is that when Rachel very kindly gave out the Wi-Fi connection, 
It's a capital BL, lowercase guest, five capital T, 23. <laughs> That's the online world. Thank you so much, Merlin. Um, I would like you to put your hands together for, we've gotten a wonderful steer from uh, Minister Joanna Shields uh, from the UK context. Pat Manson has given us an overview from an EU context. And Merlin has given us insights into the self-regulatory approach and that it's collaborative. So we, that's our steer for today. So I'd like to thank our speakers in this panel.